And now I have the pleasure of introducing today's presenters. Lou Matthews is a global mathematics creative and founder of Inspire Math, committed to building inspiring, sustainable mathematics platforms and culturally relevant education experiences in communities around the world. As director of mathematics and science at Urban Teachers, a national teacher residency program with John Hopkins University, Lou supports the recruitment, coaching, and deployment of culturally competent mathematics teachers. Shelly Jones is a professor of mathematics education at Central Connecticut State University. Before joining the CCSU faculty, Shelly was a middle school mathematics teacher and a K-12 mathematics administrator. She provides mathematics professional development nationally and internationally. You can see her CCSU TED Talk on YouTube, where she talks about culturally relevant mathematics. And Yolanda Parker has been an educator for over 25 years and has been full-time faculty at Tarrant Community College South Campus for over 10 years in the mathematics department, where she teaches primarily statistics and math for teach teacher courses. She, also, she was also recognized as a campus recipient of the 2017 Tarrant County College Chancellor's Award for Exemplary Teaching, the highest award a TCC faculty can receive. And now I will turn it over to Lou, Shelley, and Yolanda. Hello everyone, how are you? It's such a pleasure to be here. My name is Lou Matthews. I am here with two um, of my wonderful colleagues, Dr. Uh, Shelley Jones and Dr. Yolanda Parker. We are authors of the new book and we're so excited creating culturally relevant mathematics tasks is the, the subject, uh, it's a passion of ours. We met about, I'm gonna date myself, but we met about 20 years ago at Illinois State University as doc students. And you know, we just fell in love with each, with each other and, and developed a bond, both professionally and personally. And uh, we've been doing this work uh, around culturally relevant mathematics teaching for the last uh, 20 years or so together and passionately for our audiences of, of diverse communities with regards to mathematics. So it's such a, a pleasure to, to be here with you today and to, to talk about something we're so passionate about, which is our book. Um, and so we want to talk to you in, in depth about, I'm sorry, I think I just clicked on that. If someone can just click back for me. Yeah, thanks. We want to talk to you today about our journey. We want to share our passion for both culturally relevant math teaching and explore strategies for both planning um, and designing culturally relevant mathematics tasks. And you, you might ask, you know, what's so, what's so different about this book and this work, planning and designing these culturally relevant mathematics classrooms? When I think about how I was trained as a mathematics teacher, when I think about how I experienced math uh, growing up, when I think about the math books that I, I've seen, I, I really have seen books that have helped me personally think very deeply about recreating, reimagining the mathematics experiences that I see in classrooms every day and that I experience. In fact, one of the points we were just talking about before we went on air, uh, when we talk of audiences across the country, whether it's workshops or sessions or, or, or online, we ask this one question, this one question, which I think will explain our drive and our passion for, for the book, for the work. Um, we ask this question, when did you first experience mathematics in a way in which you felt that you belonged, that you mattered, where you were asked to think deeply about yourself, about your community, I mean, your community and the world around you in critical ways. And when we ask audiences that question, beyond a shadow of a doubt, from audience to audience, the answer is the same. 90 to 95% of the people who really believe in making mathematics meaningful have never yet, have never themselves experienced that that space or experience it very late in life. They didn't experience it in the K-12 experience. And so we wanted to change that. Let me look across the landscape at materials um, that exist around culturally relevant mathematics teaching. We wanted to, to really change that space for us and change what, what, you, um, what people experience and how they're able to do this work. When we think about culturally relevant teaching, let's go to, Slide, yeah. When we think about culturally relevant uh, mathematics teaching, 
we often think about a, an experience, right? We think about a journey, we think about a space where there's ch there are challenging mathematics experiences, where students and their communities, I should say, have access to challenging mathematics, and they themselves are positioned as successful doers and creators. And even if we stopped at just that one statement, I think that would be a real uh, game changer in, our, in, in the field and our work today, because when you think about what we celebrate, we just finished celebrating Pi Day, we've just finished celebrating Black History Month, how many of us celebrated mathematicians and famous people? We often think about mathematical knowledge and giftedness in the hands of other people and the creators of it, other people. And, but what if we thought differently about that? What if we thought that mathematics comes from everybody, that we can create this stuff, that we are not just successful consumers of it, but producers and creators of mathematics? There's one element of this idea of culturally relevant mathematics, right? The other is thinking, reimagining context, prompts and inquiry that come from culture and community sources. And then the last part, I wanted to get to this part, thinking about why we have tasks in the first place, what their goals are and outcomes are, right? Thinking about task outcomes that, that maybe are, are, are given to children because we want to emphasize hope and love and empathy, empathy and, and critical consciousness. If, if you follow culturally relevant pedagogy, the work of Gloria Latson Billings, culturally responsive teaching, Dini Yiva Gay, Sonia Nieto, then you probably are very familiar with this idea of affirming culture um, and critical consciousness and critical agency. Look, albeit, if you're trying to define culturally relevant mathematics teaching, you, you're you gonna have a lot of conversation because it's so many things, right? It's environment, it's the discourse, it's the way we use language, it's the way we show up in our identities, it's, it's, it's a lot of things. One of the things we found in our work I think Shelley and Yolanda would agree is that what we found missing was the emphasis on this task. Like people would always ask, okay, I haven't experienced it. I want to do it, but what does it look like, right? What does, how does it show up for me in the, in the classroom? How does it show up in the, not even just the classroom, but in the spaces I control? That could be home, that could be anywhere. And so this idea of, of, focusing on a task became a, a kind of clear focus for us and it's been the the, the 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 genesis and the continuation of our research over the last what 10 years or more around this idea of how teachers work as designers and and create culturally relevant mathematics tasks and so we focus on this dimension of culturally relevant mathematics teaching this one dimension of, of task building and, and why task building Task building because task, if you think about task, they're the hard currency, right? The hard currency of every single math experience comes down to this, this thing I put in front of people every, it represents what I think math is, it represents who I think can learn it, it represents how I think math is learned. I mean, we're in a crazy profession where, you know, someone can ask you, Sally has 59 cantaloupes and uh, she buys 59 cantaloupes and no one says, what the hell are you buying 59 cantaloupes for? You know, Sally, like, what's your problem, Sally? We don't ask these questions. We, we give tasks and we don't want children to, we want children to talk about money, count money, but don't, don't think about investment or saving. Like, don't think too deeply about money. Don't, we want you to talk about time and different things all across the elementary curriculum, but we don't want them to think deeply about it. And so when we think about task building, we think about opportunities to really give different, op different drive different outcomes, to, to inquire more deeply, um, deeply for and with children and with their communities. So when I say task building and when we talk about task building in the book, it's not just this checklist of what to do in a classroom. We see it as an act of liberation, right? A possible act of liberation. Um, creating spaces for healing and thriving and empowerment. Yes, the, all in the mathematics task. And yet, when we look across the resources, the ones we've studied, um, there's very little that help you really do to, to go in depth, to really slow down task making and task designing. So lastly, we think that if all children can learn math, then certainly all teachers are capable of reimagining, redesigning and, and creating recreating powerful mathematics tasks, but, but not just like happenstance, 
with intention and with hope. And with that, I wanted to give you that introduction to our work on culturally relevant mathematics teaching. And I meant to, to, to post a prompt, as I'm seeing getting some looks, but a prompt in the chat. When was the first time this idea of mathematics teaching and learning and tasks, building and experiences, when was the first time you audience, when was the first time you experienced that? When was your first experience with these ideas about mathematics teaching and learning? Was it elementary, middle, secondary, college? What, what, what was your first experience? Let's put it in the chat. Um, and I, I guess Yolanda and Shelley can pick that up in their conversations with you as well. I'm looking down at the chat, looking at some college. See, this is a, this is a sobering and yeah, this is interesting. Yeah. And, and Shelley, this is the people who want to do this work. Right, high school, elementary school. Yeah. Hey, we have somebody who got it in elementary school. Elem yeah, that's 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 that's, that's amazing. Exciting. Two thousand. So we are trying to express something, and you. This is where our humanity comes into the Good space. College. We're trying to express something very humbly that most of us didn't experience ourselves. That's that hits hard. We're we're trying to show children and teach us something we didn't even see. And so we're all co-creating this at the same time to be to be quite fair. In, in in our book, we talk about most notably this this idea of three major task building actions. The, the, we'll subdivide into these approaches, but there are three big things that we see as culturally relevant mathematics task building, right? That there's this idea that you have to establish enough challenge demand and access. And you'll notice we don't use the word rigor. We don't use the word rigor here. Rigor is this idea of intellectual rigor is 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 it's too it's too overstated. Because we need to extend our definition of rigor to maybe think about cultural rigor, right? And and rigor, attention to me, not just attention to the math, but attention to me and attention to community. That community rigor. So we call this this idea of, of demand and cognitive demand that you'll see in Stein and others and, and other works, we call it the purple book. As, I can't remember the title. Uh, you guys remember the title of the book, uh, Stein and, and, and the book, but we, we, we grew up calling it the, the purple book. It's uh, imp implementing standards based yeah. uh, math instruction. Yeah, and it's, it's beautiful the way they talk about cogn high, high cognitive demanding tasks, right? And so we think that tasks for all our children should be demanding. Not just demanding, though, with demand comes great access too, right? Accessible to everyone. We think everybody, all of our children are capable of highly demanding tasks. Um, we, we also think that there's a, a relevance notion, and, and that's just a, a, a word we use to try and capture this idea of centering community and cultural inquiry, not changing names and words and, and, and in context, mere context, but it's asking deeper questions of our culture and our communities. And not just the classroom community, we're talking about the collective people, like who is your people and how are you and your people doing mathematics? That's, the, that's the, not just the classroom. Here's my classroom, this is my community. No, community in the racialized, the cultural sense, the, the, that, that community. Yeah, um, and so we see culturally relevant mathematics teaching and task building as centered in that aspect, centering math in how I think about the world around me and myself and my community. And, and not just that, but it has a purpose of a agency, um, of targeting agency, but not just agency, but empathy, and not just empathy and agency, but action, not just teaching, teaching for this idea of critical thinking, but action, how do we respond? And not just respond in the individual sense, but how do we respond collectively? Like, this is my people, what are my people gonna accomplish um, doing mathematics? And I, I think what I'm trying to say for us, and we have many conversations about this, and uh, we, we, we debate and talk about this all the time, and so it's probably not an exact meaning in the space, but this idea that math, I think what you should take away from this idea of task building and culture relevant mathematics task building is that mathematics task building has to be more than just naked math problems. Um, and one way, and this, and I'll, this is my, my last part of the slide, one way we think about this 
is we've had to rethink uh, the structure of tasks. So the way tasks are structured, it doesn't let us talk about culturally relevant mathematics real well, right? I mean, let's think about it. There is a problem on the board, on the, on the screen, um, and it asks kids to solve a problem and create a representation of the solution, right? So there was three quarters of a cake left over. Diego and his friend ate two-fifths of the remaining cake. How much of the cake was left over? So math te textbooks and, and online programs are, uh, uh, you know, complete with those kinds of problems, right, where they ask students certain things. You might be familiar with these pieces, and I'll, these first two. There's always some math prompt, some math prompt such as how much of the cake was left, right? Or um, there's always some math prompt. Solve the problem by asking the doer to do something, right? We just, we just don't want to do too much. Don't think too much about this. We just, we don't care why you're having cake. We don't even, we don't even care that you like cake. We, it's not even important that you even think about mathematics in the sense of a cake, but we, we just want you to really get, really want you to get to the problem of solving. So it's a math inquiry problem. That's probably prominent in what we know. The second thing is the math constraints, right? So we say, we give some constraints. We give this three quarters of a cake is left over and we, we try to make it interesting. Two fifths is remaining over here. How much is left over altogether, right? So we, we give these conditions. You're used to that probably all throughout your life. But we found that as we were doing this work and as we were looking at tasks throughout our book and throughout our research over the years, we had to think about the cultural context. And I, I don't I don't mean to I don't want to trivialize this part of the of the I, I don't want to trivialize this part of what I'm talking about, but context is important. L listen. The names we even use in math tasks are important. Some, some people have gone to the side of, well, don't just change the name. Yeah, yeah, change the name too. That's important. But change the whole context so that it creates these conditions in which I feel that I can enter into, right? Um, and so, well, how do you determine those conditions? We'll, we, 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 well, you'll have to buy the book and take a look at it, but we, there's so many ways to enter into these conditions and create these conditions, right? Um, and Yolanda will talk about some of those ways next. Uh, but there is a need to us, for us to think more deeply about the context, the cultural context, and the conditions through which I need to do math. And we have become so addicted to naked mathematics that it, when it's presented that we have to create a cultural context, we say it's an add-on, and I don't have time for this, and we don't have time for that. And we do children an injustice when we, we privilege mathematics that has nothing to do with them, their mm -hmm. communities, or the world as they view it. What message does that send? And, but the last part is even more mm -hmm. hidden in our work, and that is, so what if you change the context, right? What is the social cultural inquiry problem? I, we, we, I didn't even know the right word to call this. We, we talked about just, we, there's got to be a shorter word for that, right? But, you know, it's, 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 it's a prompt of like, what, why are you asking me this question? And if you look at this particular problem, this is how much of the cake was left. And it's a pretty weak social cultural prompt, right? And so it's not, it's not meant to be perfect in this case. It's meant to ask you, if you wanted young people to think about a party and cake and eating cake, what, would, what might you want them, what would you want them to ask? What would you want them to inquire about? Like, mm -hmm. if you had your one shot, and think about mathematics task, right? You got your one, you have your one shot during the day to ask a question, to present a task. What do you want to ask children about? Is it about 59 cantaloupes? Is it about chocolate bars divided, three chocolate bars divided by eight people? Yeah. Or, or do you want to, like, go for it and really invoke mm -hmm. curiosity and thriving and belonging and, and empowerment? And so we... With that last bullet, we, we've had to think about thinking about tasks in that way to challenge ourselves. It, um, I don't know, Shelly, Elon, would you, would you say that as well? Like, that's the hardest part for us is that what do we want to do with this math, right? Yes, yes. In terms of asking and young, young people, asking children questions about, about, the, about the math that they're doing. So these, at least these four things, this is just a piece of it. You'll find this, if you're reading out the book, you'll find this in chapter, um, chapter uh, I believe it's chapter two or three, but it's this idea of breaking tasks down and 
maybe even standard style in this way of thinking about cultural context and this cultural prompt. Um, so we, we're excited about that part and that space. So at this I, point, I'm going to pause. I want to mention oh, something. Lou, I want to mention something really quick here. And, and just, oh, Lord, if, okay. I'll just say this really quick, right. Even sometimes when we have the, the context and we have the sociocultural prompt and you, you do the work of figuring out what that should be. And then we get to the problem and many times we're still just interested in the answer. Mm. If there's no discussion with the problem, then we're still just doing the math just for the math's sake. So I just wanted to, to mention that. Yeah. You know, Shelly, let's, let's stay on that for a second, if you don't mind. Because um, you and I talk about that. In our training, right, we are trained, indoctrinated to ask the question, where's the math? And we, even mm -hmm. when we do these problems, right, we, we get scared if we don't see enough of the math. We are so uncomfortable in mathematics with having intimate conversations about ourselves and community and the world around us. Just think about that. Like, we don't like to do that so much so that we question whether this is mathematics if it gets too deep into our personal space. And we don't have these kind of rules for thinking about humanity and how to relate to each other and how to relate to deep questions. Um, and so one of the biggest criticisms of culturally relevant teaching has always been, well, where's the math? Because we have not been taught how to have these conversations. We, we, feel, we feel like we're cheating somebody if we don't have enough math in, in a space, right? Yeah. Hey, so uh, Lindsay says, so true, math teachers really get any training on critical conversations in the math classroom. Yeah. I mean, I didn't mean to take you so far off, ladies and gentlemen, but that's, it's so, we've never slowed down the task enough, just a task, right? Mm -hmm. to, to really critique and ask people to build and think differently, but we can. Uh, and with that, I'll turn this to my colleague, Yolanda, as she talks about um, some of the strategies we, we thought about as we talked about designing and planning for culturally relevant. Uh, mathematics. Test. Okay. And so I want to have a transparent moment right now. Shelly, I was not trying to cut into you. I was trying to close my chat box and I clicked on the screen. So I apologize. So if there's anything, I'm the culprit, um, you guys, if anything uh, goes awry with the, with the presentation and I apologize. But this, um, the past few minutes, what you have noticed is what this is what we do. This this webinar is you're just taking a glimpse into conversations that the three of us have all the time, conversations that we have had over the last uh, two years, almost on a daily basis. So you'll you'll have to excuse us or not um, for for the passion that we have, because this is not just something that we're doing for show. This is something that is ingrained in us. And we're just excited to be able to um, to share it with you. And so we are talking about, um, yes, we're talking about our book, but more importantly, we're talking about the work. That's what Lou keeps on um, uh, talking about and what Shelly is going to share with you all. We're, we're um, focusing on the work, but dwindling down to the task. And so some notes that I have written and some things that I've, that I've noticed is I've talked to people about this, people who are um, willing to delve into this that that you haven't experienced as a student. Only a, a handful of you, when you answered Lou's question, you said that um, you had experienced this meaningful math um, like what we're sharing in elementary school. A large number of you was college, grad school, a training last year. You know, you are just now learning about this as a professional. And so it's hard to teach what you don't know and you're kind of navigating in the dark. And so that's where, where we come, uh, where we come in and it's challenging for us. We, when, when we were creating the tasks for the book, it was, it, it was, it was hard. Um, and so I'm just saying that to say, if you are faced with some challenges, give yourself some grace. 
Um, and so what we, the meat of our book is in, it's divided into three parts. And so in part two, it's these three chapters, four, five, and six, where we share several strategies, several approaches that you can take uh, to create the tasks. When I work with graduate students and I ask them to create culturally relevant tasks, they automatically want to do a lesson plan. And we're, we are saying, start small, start with the task, be intentional, be focused. And you see, we have 13 different approaches that you can take. And so we don't take that lightly, but this isn't to overwhelm you. A lot of these strategies are things that you may already be doing or that you can do. Like with the, the first one, we're not going to discuss in detail, but just um, using your standards, starting with your standards. I'm in Texas, so starting with um, the TEKS. I call it TEKS. Some people call it TEX, but you know what I'm talking about either way that I say it. So starting with the standards and or starting with um, some of the problems that you already have, like that Diego problem that um, Lou shared with you. Even though he said that the socio sociocultural inquiry was light, it's still a start, okay? Yeah. So you don't have to have this deep, um, groundbreaking, world-changing task, the very first one that you do, okay? Um, but just start somewhere and, and then just practice at it. But we, we are going to share uh, some tasks from the other two strategies, adapting the standards with hope verbs and creating tasks from hope verbs. And you may not be familiar with what we're talking about, but Shelly is going to share that um, the hope wheel, which is something that was created by Lou a few years ago um, as a tool to help you to uh, create your lesson plans. And so we will go into detail on that. So planning with intention and hope. And then creating creating context for cultural inquiry. And I was seeing uh, what you all were saying in the chat. You're right, the, the textbooks don't have that critical consciousness. And someone was saying, is there a book out there already? And it might not be. So you might be the one who needs to write that textbook uh, <laughs> for what we are discussing. And so we're going to uh, share how you can start with children's literature. Um, for those of you who are elementary teachers, um, I don't know what level you are, but if you're in a self-contained classroom, this is a way to integrate that reading time with math. Or even if you are um, in a departmental class, this is how you can collaborate with the English language arts teacher um, and incorporate uh, quality children's literature that has a cultural focus to create culturally relevant tasks um, and not just during Black History Month or Women's History Month or on a certain holiday, but it could be something that you do um, throughout, throughout your, your curriculum. So create intentionally creating the context that don't exist. Okay, you are starting from something that doesn't exist. So we um, share five strategies uh, in that section that you can use to create your tasks. And then creating context for agency and action. So you may remember a few slides ago, um, Lou was sharing with you the, um, what did we call it? It is where it has the had demand relevance and agency. So the task building actions. So you start with um, a task that is culturally, I mean, sorry, cognitively demanding. You have that relevance and then the agency. And this is something that may be um, the hardest part to incorporate in the task, um, to have something that isn't trivial and it is um, a context for agency and action. Uh, you, we can, um, we can change the world with math. Um, and so just teaching students how they can um, uh, focus on social justice with math um, and have empowerment. We're gonna focus on the task where you can um, illustrate standing in solidarity with the community. And these things are not out of reach for elementary students, like with justice. One of the things that Anyone who has been around any young child knows that they they know what's fair. What's fair? And what's not fair? Not fair. <laughs> um, if if you get if you have more than one child, you know that your children know what fair what fairness is, and so why not incorporate fairness into an elementary lesson? The students can handle it. I I have had 
pushback from from people who are saying, oh, the world is so political and our our kids have so much going on outside the world. I don't want to um, bring this into the classroom. It It's on their back. It comes into the classroom with them. And so why not um, show students how to mathematize and problematize things that they are dealing with every day anyway, and it, and it can become constructive. Um, and so, like I said, we are going to share tasks from five of these uh, strategies, these approaches, um, and I will share with, and I'll move it on to Shelly, who's gonna share with you the hope wheel. Before you before you um, go on, Yolanda, I just asked a question in the <laughs> chat, but I didn't. I don't know if everyone has seen it. And that is, when you look at these, which which one of these, when you saw them, stood out, you know, and and why? And I I, I love that people are ask us are suggesting these different ways in which they're seeing them as well. Mm. So which one stood out, stands out for you, and and why? If we can just give them, maybe maybe give them a few seconds just to kind of like look at it and just um, put it down in the chat. It's also helpful for us as well. Planning mm -hmm. with intention and hope. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's because of you. I want to say that that chapter is in there because of Shelly and Yolanda, because I think when we started this work, five and six seemed natural, right? Four came, four, four came later, right? The content for four came later. And I think, and I, I also, I was thinking, sitting here thinking why, and I think the reason why four is, was important, ended up being important for you all because of how you were working with teachers. And you were like, wait a minute, they need, teachers need guidance planning. It's not even just the, it, like, it's, it's the intent, before you even create the task, there has to be some real hard work in intention. Yeah. You know? and, and I think that, uh, teachers many times have they have trouble with the agency part because of what Yolanda was saying. We've been so conditioned that the, the math is the end all and the be all that we're always saying, where's the math? And we're so, you know, we have to have the math and we get it. We have to teach the math, but it's not happening the way we're doing it. So we got to rethink. And, and with agency, maybe kids will actually do the math because they're gonna be learning something that empowers them, that teaches them about themselves, that they feel good about. How about that? Like students feel good about themselves in math. Like that doesn't happen very often. And so we gotta, if we're gonna change the narrative, we have to change the thinking. And th this is gonna take administrators, this is gonna take leaders because teachers feel pressured to do I just was talking to my cousin this afternoon, a little bit before this, and she called me and she said, these first graders, I'm working with them and they, and they don't, they just, they're not grasping it. You know, they're not grasping place value. And I asked, well, what are you doing with them? Are you using anything culturally relevant? She says, I don't think so. <laughs> and so there's part of the problem is we're moving on because the, the pacing guide tells us we have to move on and the students aren't understanding and, and they're, they're, they're not understanding or seeing it. It doesn't make sense to them. They're not internalizing anything. And so I'm going to talk a little bit, if you can go to the next slide. And before you go on, there was a comment that um, I wanted to highlight. It was going so fast. I didn't see who made it, but um, definitely thank you someone for recognizing that this is getting away from the deficit mindset. And that is something that we um, reiterate in this book, this, this um, idea of hope and um, empowerment and that in, in connecting to the community. So starting with where the students are, because they bring so much into the classroom. And so um, helping teachers get away from the deficit mindset. So thank you for whoever um, added that comment. So I'm going to go quickly. I have about um, 15 minutes. The hope will helps us to create what we see as hope standards. These are goals and objectives reimagined for justice and cultural inquiry. So just sit with that for a minute, because we are still talking about teaching math, but we have goals and objectives reimagined for justice and cultural inquiry. I see, I see you, Crystal. <laughs> Teachers um, can use the will 
to select and then adapt, modify standards and intentions. So we talk a lot about content standards because that's where we are as teachers, but what are your intentions? We, I, I was in a talk earlier today and, and, and the person um, speaking said, it, some, it doesn't matter sometimes, you know, what the intention was, it's what the impact is, right? But we need to be intentional so that we have a better impact. We need to be intentional first so that we have a better um, impact. And so this is part of the task creation process. You can go to the next slide. So just as Lou said earlier, this work has been a journey, right? Go ahead to the next slide. Thank you. So along our journey, we've worked with many teachers and students, uh, pre-service students and K-12 students, and we learn from them. So in this book, we tell the stories of some of these teachers, some of these educators, I should say, because they're, some are classroom teachers, but we work with lots of people, including um, leaders. Uh, the struggles that they have becoming a culturally relevant uh, educator. So I'll share a few of the tasks from the book and I'll show how the teacher's journeys progress and how they were able to create culturally relevant math tasks. So this first task here was created using the Hope Will. And Mr. Shah asked his students to bring in photos of math in their homes and community. And he wanted them to know that they do math in their daily lives, their families do math and their communities do math. And then he gave the students a chance to present on their photo. And, and the students had a sense of pride and hope that they, were do that they are doers of math. math. So in this, pro uh, in this problem, the students were asked to present their photos and tell why was this photo, is, why is this photo important to you or special to you? And where do you think the math is? What's the math involved? And so the teacher used that information from, from those presentations in future lessons. For example, in this particular lesson, uh, Aiden, and I, I can see Aiden's face. He brought in a picture of his grandfather's garden and he was just smiling ear to ear talking about this garden. And he was very specific about how his grandfather kept the garden so clean and neat and it was in rows. And so the teacher said, well, I'll use that for talking about arrays, multiplication with arrays. And Aiden also talked about how he helped his grandfather in the garden pull the weeds out. And so basically, we're, Mr. Shah is using the hope will verb of love. He saw the love that Aiden has for his grandfather. And in, 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 in that presentation that Aiden did. And so he used that. Now, this is just a start, right? So this is one problem. It has a, one math you know, problem in it where you're thinking about math, but part of it is just having a discussion about you know, how does a, a garden, a family's garden contribute to, to the family? Maybe if you even have um, a garden in the community, how does it contribute to the community? What, what does a community garden do? So part of doing this work is hearing from students. That was one of the things I asked my cousin was, what kind of questions are you asking them? What are they talking about? What are the discussions like? That's a big part of being a culturally relevant educator is asking those questions so that students can kind of give a part of themselves. Next slide. Be patient, Shelly, I'm clicking. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, so one way to use the hope will is to choose a hope verb and then, um, and then set the intention of the task. And that's what Mr. Shah did. But there's another way that you can use this. You can also use the hope verb when you start with a math standard. And here we're starting with the TEKS. I say TEKS, the uh, Texas Essential um, Knowledge and Skills a third grade uh, math standard. So you can start with the standard and then you can build a context that, that sort of have some relevance that will create agency with the students. And in this particular one, we use the stand up. We use the stand up verb 
And really it's the protest verb. But part of the protest verb is students learning how to stand up for themselves and their communities. And so we move from a, a standard that's sort of naked and the students are solving problems by collecting and organizing information and displaying information. And then they're analyzing and interpret, interpreting the data. Well, when you think about data, data is used to make decisions about everything we do. And students need to learn that and they need to learn that they can make a difference. And so in this particular case, they're gonna stand up and they're going to uh, protest for improved voter booth distribution in their local neighborhood. And we know that that is going on. And we know that even at a young age, even in elementary school, fifth, sixth grade, students can learn about these types of things. You know, so, 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 no, uh, uh, stay, uh, stay there for a little while. <laughs> so you, know what's surprising, you know what's surprising about this is that the Hope Wheel was created at during a time, I actually just placed this on Twitter, and it came during a moment when okay. we were dealing with Ferguson or one of the one of the, listen, there's so many one of the incidences of police brutality, and and it was just shaking up my community, shaking up my world, and we were tasked with educators all around. We're tasked with well, let's go and create these lessons. Well, <laughs> nothing in Bloom prepares you for. Ferguson, nothing in Bloom prepares you for COVID. Bloom has these, what, analyze and, and uh, these, these kinds of verbs, but nothing, to, nothing has prepared us to use verbs like stand up and protest and reimagine or restore, right? And, mm. or forgive, like, why is it that we were never, why that we never were like taught to use verbs like this here, powerful human verbs to think deeply about mathematics in the time of COVID, in the time of, of, of racial injustice. And, and so we needed something, I thought that we needed something more, right, to, to put on the table. But what I was shocked about, Shelly, is that this is probably, I think this is gonna be people's favorite part of the book. I, I didn't realize that people would like it, but because it's such a simple, simple idea. And that is, let's just use a different verb, you know, you, uh, you, to, to think about our work. It, you know what, it's simple, but it's so different from what we're used to thinking about when we think about math. And that's, yeah. it's, it's different, but it's so needed. And I think that's why people um, will, they will gravitate toward this. Because mm -hmm. when you use these verbs, you really are getting at the heart of students. You're getting at their agency. And, and, and really, I, I, just that word hope yeah. says it all. I mean, because we, we have to be hopeful because yeah. after the pandemic, we all as educators said, you know, we're going to listen to students and we're going to do things differently. And just today or the other day, someone said, we're not doing that. Like we're going, we're just falling right back into what we've always done. And I, I just can't imagine doing that. Like we should be hearing from students, not about learning loss, but about what did you do? Because yeah. then we can use that information in our lessons. What did you do at home? Yeah. You know, what did you miss not being in school? Ask the students that. Yeah. How about that? Because we're, we're always telling them what, they're, what they've lost. And, and for many families, many families will tell you, we found things during the pandemic. They'll tell you more about things they found than about things yeah. they lost. We all lost mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. but many families found things. Mm -hmm. They found together think, time. They found, they, they learned about mm -hmm. their children. They learned right. about their children. How about that? That's right. That's um, right. That's all right, next, right. next slide. And, and as yes, you're doing that, teacher, edu teacher educators will like, will like the fact that we're asking, this is, we teach, we, we all teach these kind of methods courses raw, and um, teacher educators like us will like the fact that um, it's asking them to make sense of standards because one of the things teachers, uh, particularly beginning teachers have struggled with is here's the standard. I don't know how to make it come alive. Um, and so this is helpful for that as well. So Yolanda, the other day, uh, um, excuse me, the other day, Yolanda just a minute ago talked about children's literature and how um, 
<laughs> how there's a focus of children's literature at the elementary school. And when we talk about, and so on the Hope Will, will there, there are two places on the Hope Will where we talk about literature. One is inquiring from children's literature and the other one is agency. I mean, when, when people look for books two or three years ago, let's say black people, like if, if, if a black male was looking for a book for his black son, and actually it's, it was a black mother looking for a book for her black son that, was, that could, could teach him about black sons and black fathers, she could not find one. And so she wrote one. Anyway, uh, so children's literature is a great way to introduce children to math that's all around them. And we have a um, math connection favorites, like the very hungry caterpillar, the button box, the greedy triangle, and many more. So when we say literature, people's minds go to that type of literature when we say math and literature, right? They think of literature that has students counting, you know, um, the doorbell ring. Okay, we love those, but we want you to think differently. We want you to think about diverse books that have like a historical focus, a social justice focus, uh, um, um, authors of color. So we want you to think differently about the books that you uh, bring into the math classroom. And so that's what we began to do in the book. Uh, we gave a few examples of books that you might use and, and how you might use them. And so we choose books that don't already have a math focus, Instead, we choose diverse book, books written by diverse authors with an emphasis on authors of color. And you can look for other books that focus on culture and social events. And the books we chose can be used to explore math based on grade level standards, that's fine. And they can be used as a springboard for these other discussions that students really wanna have. Students wanna have these discussions about social justice issues. And we can, we can bring in the math. The math is there. One of the things we talk about, though, is, I forgot to mention it, is sometimes when you have a context and you cannot find a math connection, it doesn't mean you shouldn't do the lesson. Math doesn't have to be privileged all the time. So it's okay to do that lesson without the math focus. But if it brings your students in, to the lesson, that's worth it right there. Because we keep saying the students aren't interested, the students aren't interested. And then all of a sudden you do, do this lesson and they're interested. Do the math the next day. Shelly, there's in the chat, Shelly, I'm just monitoring mm -hmm. chat. People are asking about this, and I'll throw this out as a prompt. Um, Tom and Janice, uh, I love suggesting book lists. I, I know that we, <laughs> Mm -hmm. I, I, I should have, but I know that we mentioned some titles, movies, all sorts of stuff, because mm -hmm. even when you think literature, think media as well, right? So we offer titles, but it's not exhaustive enough. enough. I have seen lists on Instagram and Facebook, but maybe the audience is suggesting, maybe we can do this, Corwin, as an addendum. We can, mm -hmm. we can add to the online site for this book maybe a, just a, there's some, some lists that people can find helpful. I mean, I, audience, just list the book. If you, know of, if you know of these kinds of books that we're talking about where there's agency and cultural inquiry from literature, um, can, you, can you put that in the chat just for the sake of the people in the chat? And I and love I, the book, I Love My Hair. I just mentioned that to my students um, mm -hmm. the other day because I work oh, with pre-service teachers and I have them choose a book and write just write differentiated problems from the book then i also have students write their own children's book and so this is for my pre-service teachers but that could be something that you do with your students if they're not seeing themselves represented just like that mother didn't see her son represented then write your own book there's mm -hmm. no reason why that can't be the case and um we are running close to the end of the presentation. Yeah, so I'm going to say next slide, Yolanda, you're going to say one thing real quick, and then we're going to probably wrap it up. Okay, and Shelly is the boss of us. So, uh, <laughs> so right. we, um, <laughs> this is um, a way, because I saw in the chat earlier that someone noticed, oh, th this is simple. 
what what you all are doing and and yes you you can make it we have 13 approaches in this book you don't have to use all 13 of them um you can just you can try the ones that work best for your teaching style your learning style your students um and it may be different one strategy you use this year and another one you use next year so one one way is to adapt a task you don't have to create from um from scratch uh and so one of the strategies is standing in solidarity with community so the original task is this office building with 14 rooms and you can see how much paint is needed for one room how much paint do we need for all the ceilings um some students may or may not care about painting a ceiling. They really probably won't care about an office building. But if you change it to neighborhood cleanup, some of the students may have um, participated in that. I know uh, after a lot of the protests and, and, um, and, um, and outcry for justice, there were neighborhoods who did do um, cleanup efforts. And so this is a way that you could have that same idea but it has a solidarity with the community focus where you see how much paint is needed to paint a neighbor's fence. And then you want to paint seven neighbor's fences, how much paint is needed, and then how could you adapt it to your neighborhood? So bringing the student into, um, into the, 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 um, the task, into the problem, into the math, for them to care more than just about the answer, but what we can do after we get the answer and how we can use math um, in the real world and in um, in our, our community. And so in conclusion, uh, some just some of the takeaways from our book when we wrap it up, we see teachers as engineers. So the design of, of our book is an engineering designing um, uh, engineering design where uh, student where math teachers can create learning experiences for students that are engaging, inspiring, and empowering, which I think that you all can kind of see that just from uh, this last 50 minutes or so uh, talking with us or us talking with you. I mentioned before, take it one task at a time. Start small. You don't have to try to create a brand new <laughs> lesson unit from scratch. You can just modify a task, modify a standard and you have made a start. Open yourself up to feedback from your students and the community. So not just the sage on stage, but even not just talking with your students. Get your parents involved. Like with that paint um, task, if you're if you have some students whose parents are contractors, then maybe they could come in and 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 talk to you. Maybe um, modify the task to make it more meaningful to them. There's a task um, in the book about making masks. My mother is a seamstress. And so that that gave her an opportunity to feel like she was really doing, she is the first to say that she's not good at math, but that gave her a contribution um, to the book. So open yourself up for feedback, um, make yourself vulnerable enough to, to um, listen to what the students and the community are saying. Approach this work with the spirit of caring, curiosity, empathy, and open-mindedness. And just by the fact that you all are here, that is speaking volumes. And so sharing the work with, with your colleagues who, who may need a little bit of a nudge, but they still have that same spirit of caring um, and, um, and open-mindedness, that's really the key for um, people who aren't necessarily on board yet. But above all, embrace the journey. It, it's not going to be easy, but the payoff is definitely going to be worthwhile. And we're still, we're still working on this too. Um, I, I'm not even there yet. Um, to where I feel like I can come up with the perfect task and, and that's imperfection is probably not the best goal to have. So it's a journey. Okay. So just give yourself, uh, give yourself some grace in that. And I don't know if we have allowed enough time for questions because there's going to be um, a drawing at the end, but in the chat, um, a lot of you have already been sharing some really, really great things, but moving forward, what is one commitment you will make to grow as a culturally relevant educator? So please um, add that into- Someone said buy the book. That's the commitment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That can be one thing. And then the next step after you, <clears throat> excuse me, after, after you buy the book. Buy the book. 
<laughs> and so we have put our Twitter handles on. And if you post anything on Twitter, um, please include the hashtag CRM task and please include all of us and Corwin uh, tag all of us in your, in, as you can see, I don't use Twitter a lot, so I don't use the right lingo. Tag us in your posts and use the hashtag. <laughs> Um, so if you have um, any questions, like I said, I don't know if we left enough time. So you can, you're more than welcome to reach out to us and we will gladly um, respond to you. But thank you so much for joining us. That was wonderful. Yes, it's, I think you just had such a wonderful conversation that we don't have time for questions, but I love that you've um, said to reach out to you on Twitter. So if you do have questions for the authors, please send, please reach out to them on Twitter. And just another big thank you to Lou, Shelley, and Yolanda. That was wonderful. Everyone will be getting a recording of the webinar. Thank you, everybody, for coming.